the more the message grows. And we're going to look at Save America 3 today. I look at who's going to save America this past week, and I started to get a little bit rattled. I started to get a little bit concerned, and I started to get shaken up. Because for a long time, I thought the church would be the ones to save America. And then I looked at America, and I looked at, took a good long look at America, and I began to see that we're being hijacked not only from within the system, we're being hijacked from without the system as well. And we're being hijacked by a godless and wicked people like George Soros, the World Economic Forum, and the CDC, and the World Health Organization as well, by liberals on the left and rhinos on the right, we're being hijacked by the President of the United States. Amen. Maybe you didn't hear me. We're being hijacked, church, and we've got to stand and we've got to fight. Amen. You have Presbyterians supporting same-sex marriages. You have Methodists, many of their pastors and leaders are supporting gays and lesbians as church members as well as ordaining them into the ministry, supporting their sinful lifestyle. You have Episcopals, they just created a new position, a director of LGBTQI. You have Lutherans supporting gay marriage, ordaining homosexuals to be pastors. The church of God has no position, no mixed position. Position, uh, uh, positions on this and uh, on transgender. They don't even know where they stand. So does the United Church of Christ. You have many Catholics who are waving flags of LGBTQ supporting abortion. You have some of these very denominations supporting the woman's choice to abort their babies and they're denouncing Crisis pregnancy centers, and I'm talking about Catholics, they're denouncing crisis pregnancy centers saying they won't support them because they're going to support abortion. Do you see why the world is crumbling? Do you see what's happening to the church? So many of the churches are pro-death. They're paying women to go across state lines to travel aboard, abroad just so they can get abortions, just like New Mexico. But I've got good news for you. We're fighting it in New Mexico. We're going to go after it. And you say, well, well, you can't go after Santa Fe. You can't go after Albuquerque and Cruces. Let me tell you, we're going to go after this Easter in New Mexico. And we're going to make it a sanctuary city here in Clovis and a sanctuary county. And then it's going to spread from Roswell to Quay County as well. We are not going to have abortion on this side of the state. Somebody say amen. We're fixing to get this on now, folks. We're fixing to get it on. And I'm going to need every one of your help to stop this train of madness coming down the road. You've got states wanting to pay for women to have their abortions. You have Southern Baptists who have just uh, had their annual meeting. And they just passed a resolution. They denounced the prosperity gospel. And I quote, The resolution noted that God and God alone is the highest good and our supreme treasure. Not health, not wealth, not the removal of sickness. They don't believe God has the power to change situations. But I've got good news for you. God is almighty. He can change anything He wants to change. They don't believe that God can bless you financially. They don't believe that you can walk in health. They don't believe that people can be healed or that God can use believers to lay hands on the sick and anoint them with oil and the sick will be healed. And yes, you even have full gospel churches that are caving in to the left that wants to destroy this country. One of the most well-known black preachers in America who is spirit-filled, who built his ministry on tithing, now says he was wrong all that time. And if you bought a book, if you bought a CD, and if you bought anything of his, just go ahead and burn it. Because he said he lived in fear because he did not tithe on one portion of money. He had just bought a brand new car. <laughs> Help me if I need help. He just bought a brand new car uh, at Mercedes. And his tie for that week was $100.26. He had the $100, but he didn't have the $0.26. Cents, and he felt condemned that God would not honor him, love him, and send him to hell because he didn't have the $0.26. Cents. That is absolutely absurd. 
You know, if he's going to talk like that, why doesn't he give every, every money that he's made from books, tapes, and records, and, and all the CDs, and all of that, why don't he give the money back after 35 years of ministry? You see, I believe in tithing, and I believe that God wants to bless the tither. The church has just gone walk, and it's just gone nuts. We have another black pastor on the other coast. This pastor... He supports abortion with everything in him, and he supports Maxine Waters. As a matter of fact, this is what he is, a full gospel pastor, but he has had three women he's had babies with, plus his wife. I'm telling you, the church is sick, and Jesus needs to come and move in the lives of those people. They don't believe God can do all those things. God gave us the power to the church to be victorious. God gave the power to the church to be triumphant as well as to live this Christian life. But He also gave us power over death, hell, and the grave. Somebody ought to shout. And the devil is doing everything he can to trash this and to throw it away so that you won't do the works of God because the works of God destroys the works of the devil. This is the answer to the insanity in our world. But we've got Christians that don't live it. We've got Christians that don't read it. We've got Christians that go from week to week to week and never pick up the Word of God. If we're going to see America saved, we're going to have to get into the book. Jesus said in John 14, 12, Most assuredly, I say to you, He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do. Because I go to my Father. That same work you see me doing, he's going to do it. We're going to do it. What are some of those works that we are supposed to be doing? The works consist of healing all manner of sickness and disease. The works consist of casting out the devils. The works consist of cleansing the leper, doing deliverance of all the works of the enemy. Do you see, Christians, we've got a big job. Somebody, amen. we got a big job, but we got a big, big God. Somebody say amen. we got a big God we got a big job and a big God, and Christ has given us the power to come against the devil and all his tricks and all his schemes and all the wickedness in this world. And we do it by faith. We are persuaded. We are confident. We are going to fully rely and depend on the Word of God to come true when we speak it out of our mouth. We have total, absolute dependence on this Word. We're surrendered to the Word. We're yielded to the Word. We're obedient to the Word. And we're trusting God in His faithfulness. There's absolutely nothing we can't do. I have a video this morning I want to play for you here of Reinhard Bonnke, one of the greatest evangelists that ever lived. And I want to show you what's happening in our world. After nine years of forced absence absence from Nigeria, the Lord reopened the door for the Crusades. An astounding surge of salvation followed. What you are about to see is glorious. And historic. Nigeria, total registered decision cards, 1,276,840. Nigeria, total registered decision cards, 1,416,740. Total registered decision cards, 1,403,640. Total registered, 1,936,881. Tonight, you may come here as weak as can be. You will go home like a conqueror. 
with Jesus inside of you. One million eight fifty nine five zero three. Six hundred and thirty-four thousand four hundred and thirty-one. Three million four hundred and sixty one thousand one hundred and seventy one decision cards. Not people there, people that made decisions. can do it in a third world. I've got news for you. He can do it here in New Mexico, in Clovis, and in you and I. But it has to take somebody that surrendered. It has to take somebody that will give up a little bit of their comfort. It will have to take somebody that has a passion. It will have to take somebody that gives a rip. It's got to take you, church. You see, Linda and I bought a motor home three years ago. We were ready to go travel. We were ready to re slow down and have a good time. God called me to this great church. We've said for three years, we're not going to stay in a church that's not going to move. We're not going to stay in a church that's not going to do something for God. We're not going to see a, go, stay in a church that's just going to be average and plain Jane. We're going to come and bring the fire of God. And that's why we're here. We didn't come to play tiddlywinks and pick up sticks. We come here to reach people for Jesus. Amen. We need you to jump in and help. We need you. The world is falling apart. Lives are being shattered. What are we going to do? Sit in slumber and sleep? No way. We came to fight with you. 
We want to see what's possible. We want to see what's plausible. We want to see what's probable. We want to see what's more than likely to happen. We want to see what's thinkable. We want to see the doable. We have an unlimited potential available to you and I. We just need to get on with the job of touching people and touching lives. That's the reason we're going to have Joshua and Christine Humphreys back August 7th through 10. They're going to bring the fire. It's going to be overwhelming. We're going to see a mighty move of God. I need you to get on board. Yeah, it's going to be some trips. Yeah, it's going to take some time. Yeah, it's going to be difficult. Yeah, it's going to be hard. Yeah, it's going to be a rough week. But the truth of the matter is, it's going to provide much fruit for the kingdom of God. And you see, that's what the Lord's waiting on. He's waiting on us to bring in the fruit. And He's going to do the work. So you get ready. Why don't we use the unlimited potential available to us? You see, if you see somebody with cancer, go lay hands on them. If you see a problem with somebody that has kidney failure, go lay hands on them. Liver problems, lay hands on them. Put your hands on them. Why? Because Jesus said, you will do greater works. I want you to know if you're saved. I want you to know if you're born again. I want, to know, I want you to know if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You and I are to do greater works. Greater works. God needs you to get after it. You're His hands. You're His feet. You're His mouth. We wonder why things are being undone in America. Because you're not even a part of the game. Get in the game. Jesus said you'll do greater works. Lazarus didn't have much going on in that grave, did he? Amen. You remember Lazarus? He died and they put him in the grave. He didn't have blood pressure. He had no pressure whatsoever. It was zero over seven, zero. Nothing worked, nothing functioned. His eyes didn't work, his ears didn't work, his brain didn't work, his kidneys didn't work, his heart didn't work, his liver didn't work, his lungs didn't work, his pancreas didn't work. Every organ was totally shut down on Lazarus. He was deader than dead. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, roll that stone away. And even the people that wanted him to come back thought, Whoa, wait a minute, Jesus. It's a little too late. He's been in the tomb for four days. Do you know how bad he's rotted? Do you know how bad he smells? Do you know you don't want to do that? Do you know that? And Jesus said, Roll that stone away. Even the people that wanted him to come back thought it was going to be too late. It's over. It's done, Jesus. They said, Master, you can't do this. And Jesus said, did I not tell you you'd see the glory of God if you believe in John eleven forty? 40? I want you to know you will see the glory of God if you stick with us, if you get on board, if you get on the, the train with us, you will see the glory of God if you believe. Somebody say amen. amen. How many of you want to see the glory of God? Anybody here? Give the Lord a hand. I want to see the glory of God show up in America and I want it to begin right here in Clovis. What happened in Nigeria could easily happen in America, but we can't wait for it to happen. Revival has to start within each one of us and every one of us. We can start a countrywide revival here in Clovis. But if it hasn't happened yet, because why? Why hasn't it happened? Because we are too complacent. We're too indifferent to God and His Word. We're too secure. We're too smart. We've got too high of an intellect. We're too secure in our wealth and their comforts of what we have. We're not willing to go out of the way. We're not willing to contend for revival. We're not ready to pray for revival. We're not ready for revival to come because it's difficult. We have to believe and he will, you will see the glory of God. John chapter 11 verse 39 through 44 Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench. You think an old skunk in the road is bad. You didn't see or hear nothing yet. You didn't smell nothing yet. You didn't see nothing yet. For he's been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and he said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. And I know that you'll always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And when we 
Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot in grave clothes. And his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. It's a good thing Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. Because if he would have said, come out, everybody in the grave would have just popped up and popped out. The graveyard would have been empty that day. The same way the devil lost his hold on Lazarus, my prayer is that he loses his hold on you today. You see, some of you are walking around with grave clothes. Some of you are walking around like mummies, petrified mummies. You haven't done a thing for God in so long. He wouldn't know what to do with you. He doesn't even recognize you because you just look like a petrified mummy with grave clothes on. I declare and I pronounce and I proclaim today the devil loses his grip on you now, in Jesus' name, every one of you, his grip on our nation is gone. It's no more in Jesus' name. In Acts chapter 4, verse 32 through 35, all the believers were united. You see, that's the problem. So many of the believers in the church, they're not united. So many people in the church, they are scattered like quail. You can't find them. You can't find them with hunting dogs. You can't find them with a search warrant. You can't find them with a SWAT team. You can't find them with the CIA and the drones. I want you to know, church, we need you on board if we're ever going to shake a city for Jesus. All believers come together. They shared everything and they testified to the powerful, to the resurrection of Jesus and God's great blessing on them. I want God's greatest blessings on you. This is a new concept in our world. There should be no needy people in the church. I, maybe you didn't hear me. There should be no needy people in the church. Pastor, can you do this for me? Can you do that for me? There should no longer be any destitute people in the church. There shouldn't be any indigent people in the church. There shouldn't be any deprived people in the church. There shouldn't be any uh, disadvantaged people in the church. No more handouts. Because why? We have God's great blessings on us. We don't need government. We don't need financial help from them. We don't want their money. We don't need a sugar daddy. Somebody say amen. amen. As we do greater works, things will change. We're going to walk in the blessing of God. Is anybody going to go with me? I said, we're going to walk in the blessing of God. Is anybody going to go with me? We're going to walk in the blessing of God. And the word of God always restores dignity to the people. Lester Summerall said, everywhere he preached in third world countries like Nigeria, uh, many of them would come without clothes. And after they came to hear him preach, the next night they would come covered up. The gospel always makes you aware. You're not a beggar. You're not an animal any longer because God restores dignity. I'm ready for dignity to be restored in the church in the house of God. When the Supreme Court made their rulings the other day, you had people acting like fools, dressed like freaks, screaming like jackals in the street. A young gal grabbed the mic as they had a pro-life rally and she shouted out, I love killing babies! Then you had another woman that was dressed really in a very tight shirt, she was about nine months pregnant, and there she was as big as a VW, and her shirt said, it's not a baby yet. Without God, people have no dignity. Without God, people have no sanity. Without God, reason flies out the door. Without God, rationality just vanishes in thin air. Without God, there's no common sense. Without God, there's no good sense. Without God, there's no self-respect. In Clovis, just the other day, they had a pro-choice rally. Excuse me. Mis misstatement there. They had a pro-death rally on Main Street. They were cussing. They were spitting. They were vile. They were filthy. They were garbage just being spewed out all over Main Street. They turned into animals, jackals, the lowest form of life. 
But when you have the gospel, when you have Jesus living inside of you, when you have Christ inside of your heart, dignity is restored. Dignity is returned. Dignity is reinstated. Look at the pro-life people. Would you look at them? Just look at the pro-life people. They are normal, right mind, and rational, and logical, and reasonable. And you say, Pastor, you're sure doing a lot of shouting today. Those that are for abortion, they are stark raven nuts and they're demonic. I've never gone somewhere and acted like those fools screaming and cussing at things I didn't like. If you see me doing something stupid like that, tase me, bro. Just tase me. Pro-life people have peace, joy, sanity, rationality, sanity, because the gospel brings dignity to people. In order for the destruction of this nation to happen, socialism, communism, irrational, illogical, unreasonable people are going to have to change. Government wants to think that you're just an animal. Government wants you to think that you're a victim. Government wants you to think that you're weak. Government wants you to think that you're just a casualty in life that needs to be fed, that needs a home, that needs to be housed, that needs to be taken care of like an invalid. When you get the Bible and when you get the Word of God, you will realize you are created in the image of God. And you'll know your source. You'll know your provider. You'll know your supplier. You'll look like Him. You'll smell like Him. You'll think like Him. You'll speak like Him. And the Word continues to renew this thing up here. So you stop acting like jackals and start being perfected in the name of Jesus. I see it happening today in Clovis. Jesus is the answer. I want those godless, wicked people to get saved. They're demonic. They need to be delivered. They need to be Jesus Christ to come into life. Those pro-death people scream, cuss, rant, and rave, upset and mad, fussing and fuming, screaming. They have rights saying, my body, my choice. They're acting like the south end of a donkey. What's the problem? It's the demon. When the Lord moves like He did with the Supreme Court a few weeks ago, it reveals a demonic agenda behind what's going on. And the funny thing is, all those people said if Roe versus Wade was going to be overturned, they weren't going to have sex till they were married. Hallelujah! That's what we've been preaching for decades. The greatest form of birth control is abstinence. We've been trying to tell them for years. You talk about slow learners. I'm glad they're finally catching on. God has dealt a death blow to the devil with the Supreme Court in the past couple of weeks. Now this generation of babies that are being saved, I'm praying for the greatest evangelists to come out of there. I'm praying for them. I'm praying for the greatest men preachers and women preachers. I'm praying for the evangelists that come out of there, the singers that come out of there, the people on the praise team, the people with the instruments, the people that are ushers, the people that are deacons, the people that are elders, the people that are pastors. I'm praying we see the greatest revival because abortion was stopped. Somebody ought to shout, Am I the only one? Woo! Mm. Oh God. With this taking place in the Supreme Court, we're going to see signs and wonders and miracles that has ever been taking place. It's going to be the greatest time of our lives. The left liberals love to say, the majority of America supports abortion. Why do they say that when 26 states make it illegal and 25 supports it? They don't know the truth. You remember what Tom Cruise said? They don't know the truth and they can't handle the truth. 26 is the majority. The transgender trash being pushed down our children, that's a bridge too far. That CRT, it's a bridge too far. People accepted abortion. But when did abortion really start backfiring? When they went from partial birth, uh, birth uh, uh, abortion to full-term abortion and then to killing a child a week after the baby is born. 
After one week, they could decide to kill the baby and it wouldn't be murder. I want you to know, it's murder the first day of conception. They give the mother of the baby a window to decide whether to keep the baby or not. She's got a week. She's made all of her appointments. She's taken all of her prenatal vitamins. She gets the name for the boy or the girl. She gets the name and she also buys the maternity clothes and baby clothes and a baby shower and got the gifts and prepares a nursery and paints the walls. And five days after that baby's born, they want to kill the baby. I've got news for you. That's wicked, evil, heinous, and depraved. That's an animal. But when Jesus gets a hold of people, He gives you dignity and you don't think like that. You don't do stuff like that. Devil, that's a bridge too far. I don't support abortion at any time. I believe there's some... They always like to say, well, for the life of the mother. That never happens, folks. So rare, you'd find... It'd be easier to find a dollar in a Baptist church. Some of you will catch that later in online. I can say that because I was one. I'm working harder than you're listening. The devil's overstepped his bounds. The devil's went way too far. It's a bridge too far when you have a man dressed as a woman shaking his backside trash to a five-year-old in a library telling them stories. My friend Ricky went to Las Vegas. What did you say you saw? He named it. <laughs> you saw two come in? One had a longer beard than you? The, the lady had a longer beard than the guy. Kind of jealous. <laughs> It's a sick world we're living in. It is a sin-sick world we're living in. And we've got these, ki these kids that are impressionable. And these transsexuals are coming up there. Transgender are coming up there. And they're shaking their backsides to kids. That is child abuse. I'm talking we need a red wave and a tsunami. And I'm really not talking about a Republican red wave. What I'm talking about is we need the blood of Jesus to flow over this nation. Coast to coast and border to border. What Jesus did on the cross is what's going to save humanity and what's going to save America. Lord God, save America now in the name of Jesus. I'm believing and I'm praying for revival. And in the name of Jesus, His coming. Our church will be the linchpin. And our church will be the soul winning station. And I'm praying our church is the one that is filled with people in healing lines from left to right and out the door in Jesus' name. Our church is going to thrive. Our church is going to grow. Our church is going to expand. God's great blessing is going to be on this house. There was power in the early church. Power to overthrow the devil. But the power has to be activated. I say the power has to be activated. I say the power in this church has to be detonated. The power in this church has got to be set in motion. Say, I have the power. Now would you say it like you mean it? Oh, you're doing much better today. Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, Therefore I remind you, stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. Stir up the gift because the fire inside of you fans the flame. When I lay my hands on people, anything Jesus commands, He empowers. What's the point of taking my hand and putting it on somebody's head and asking God for them to be healed? What's the point of fingertips touching a forehead? What's the point of that? Because you could have sinners all day long that could line people up and they touch their heads. Nothing ever changes. Because there's nothing special about putting your hands on somebody's head. What's special and what the reason is different is for us to do that. The Bible says you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. The reason it's different is because Christ commands us to do it. He commands it and He empowers it. Anything Christ commands, He empowers. He said if He commands it, He empowers it. The secret of the church is that we've got to believe that we can do greater works. 
I'm praying for greater works to happen at Grace Fellowship Church. I'm praying for greater works to happen in your life. I want you to be used of God. I want you to be a tool of the King. I want you to be used for His glory. I'm praying for greater works to happen here and the church to explode. You see, there's a lot of churches watching their fancy preachers. Three-piece suits. No, they don't wear that anymore, do they? They got holes in their jeans and tennis shoes and bleached blonde hair. And, oh, God help America. You see, I don't want to fit in with my contemporaries. I want to fit in with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I don't want all the bells and I don't want all the smoke and I don't want all the glitz and the glamour. I don't want all of that. The trash and the treasure. I want Jesus to come. I want Jesus to come. I want Jesus to come. Rule and reign and power and victory today in this house. Today in your life. Man, if I could just get you turned on. If I could just get that button flipped. If I could just switch the switch in your life. God's going to move, I guarantee you. Oh my, I'm praying for greater works to happen in this church. Some people say, well, what are you going to do when this church grows beyond the capacity of the church? We're going to do something. We're not going to have a revolving door where you come in for 30 minutes and where you pick up your communion on the way out and say, see you next Sunday. Because people need ministry. America needs ministry. People need ministry. That's why we're here. People need help. People need minister to. And they're so, we are supposed to be the helper. A lot of preachers, they just want to come and to the pulpit and they want to stand at the pulpit. They want to change their world with a 30-minute dissertation and three points in a point. And then they want to go home. I'm here to tell you. I'm here to tell you. I'm here to set people free in the name of Jesus. I'm here to help people. I'm here to to see people healed, delivered, saved. People are going through hell in America. People are going through hell right here in Clovis. And we don't have time to preach a measly, powerless gospel. Jesus taught, He preached, He laid hands on people, every one of them. Do you remember He did that day after day after day after day? And then there was a lot of small children that came up to Jesus. And they brought children to Jesus. And parents said, well, Jesus, would you bless our kid? Now, Peter, he was no stranger to hard work. Peter was no stranger to hard work. He was a big, burly fisherman. He was a commercial fisherman, which is ranked at one of the top jobs for being the most taxing job ever with lumberjacks. Peter said, hey, enough. Enough. Jesus is tired. Let him rest. And what did Jesus say? No, bring the little children to me. And he laid hands on them and he blessed them. And then he got into the boat, took a nap, and went to the next place and started again. You know what? We're here to recreate that. I said, we're here to recreate that. We go hard. We do the work of the ministry. Not just give people a little lesson and turn them out. And uh, it's our job. It's our job to heal the sick, cast out devils, and raise the dead. Freely you receive, freely you give. And the only price to receive the power of God is you've got to be hungry and you've got to be thirsty. Do I have any hungry, thirsty people here today? Say, i got to have the power. Oh, say it like you mean it, church. I gotta have the power. We gotta have it. Do you remember the little lady? She pressed through the crowd. She had been sick for years. She heard that Jesus was going to come. She heard about Jesus. She had a, a problem for 12 long years. Almost every miracle in the Word of God starts with somebody that's desperate. A woman with an issue of blood. A woman who suffered day after day, week after week, year after year, for 12 long years. She endured this terrible situation. She spent everything she had. She went to every pharmacy. She went to every doctor. She's no better. As a matter of fact, she's worse. And she heard about Jesus. She had one shot. She had one chance. One chance for a change in her life. And she heard about Jesus. She said to herself, I'm going to go touch him because I know, Mm, this is it, I know, I know, I know when I touch him I'll be healed. She believed and she pressed through the crowd and she grabbed a hold of his garment. Jesus said, who touched me? And Jesus didn't know she got healed. He just knew that somebody laid hands on him and got some power from him. 
Who touched me? The disciples said, Jesus, have you lost your mind? Do you see this crowd? There's a whole crowd of people around Jesus. And he said, no, somebody deliberately touched me. Somebody deliberately pressed in and touched me. You can be right in the presence of God. Catch this, catch this. You can be right in the presence of God and miss Him. I believe that we are in the presence of God right here now. And I believe, sad enough to say, there are some people that's going to miss it. They're not going to catch it. They're not going to get anything that I said. They're not going to understand anything that went on. They just think that guy is nuts up there. But I want you to understand, there's going to be some people that miss it just like those people with the lady here. She said, I believe. I believe. You can be right in the presence of God and you can get nothing. Disciples missed it. The religious people missed it. The teachers of the law missed it. Never got it. Religious people missed it. And that's how a lot of people are in church. There are churches in our world, they go to church, to church, to church, and nothing ever happens in their life. They go from prayer service to prayer service to prayer service, and they never get nothing. They go to revival after revival after revival and get nothing. They go to Bible study after Bible study after Bible study and never get nothing. Why is that? Because of indifference. Turn from your indifference. Turn from your cold, lukewarm ways and press after Jesus. Do you remember Revelation 3, verse 15 and 16? I talked about it. Where are you sitting? Are you hot or are you cold? But so many of the church are stone cold, callous, and could care less. But this woman said, <laughs> He's the son of a living God and I'm going to get to him. She said, I believe there's power in him. She said, I'm done with my affliction. I'm done with my sickness. I'm done with my disease. I'm done with my illness. I'm done with the suffering. I'm done with the pain. I'm done with the problem. I'm done with the trouble. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. And I'm not waiting any longer. So she went pressing through that crowd and she reached in and she touched Jesus. And immediately she could feel power and healing virtue come flow through her body. And she could tell that her affliction had dried up. Somebody ought to shout. I heard the negative Nancy say, whenever God wants to touch me, he'll just touch me. Are you kidding me? Do you not realize that the King of kings and Lord of lords is here in this house? He's ready to move. He's ready to touch you. He's sitting on ready. Nobody is going to come into this place like And leave out of here not changed. You're going to leave here changed by the power of God. The woman trembled. The woman shook. And she acknowledged she had touched him. She came to Jesus and said, I'm the one. She thought she was going to get yelled at. She thought she was going to get cussed and screamed at. Jesus said, daughter, be encouraged. Your faith made you well. Faith reached out. Faith doesn't wait to come uh, for you to come. And and faith doesn't wait to to come to you. It reaches you. You reach out to faith and you take it in. Matthew 11, verse 12 says, The kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. They take it by force. When you see something in the Bible that you want, go after it in Jesus' name. Don't just sit there, go out and take it. You say, Father, I see what's in this word. I see what's in here and I want it. I see what's in this word and I like it. I see what's in this word and I need it. And you curse the devil's plan that he's going to stop you from getting what you want in the word. You tell him, devil, I'm standing on the word and I'm going to take the word. All my sickness is gone. All my disease was laid on him. He thinks he can put it back on you. Ain't no way it's going to happen. I take my healing by faith in the name of Jesus. I'm taking it. I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to hope. I know what God's Word says. And if God says it's mine, I'm going to take it by faith. Now that sounds a little strong. Do a little exercise with me. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels. How many people did Jesus ever rebuke for having too strong a faith? Ooh, not a one. 
Did Jesus ever condemn somebody for having too much faith? For having mega faith? For having mega faith? For having hyper faith? No, no, no. Jesus rebuked only one person. And that is the person who had little faith. He rebukes unbelief. He rebuked doubt. And He did it harshly. He reprimanded people with unbelief and doubt. He scolded them. He admonished them. He took them to task. He raked them over the coals. But He always commended faith. Well done, young lady. Well done, young lady. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for pressing in. Well done. Well done. Well done. You came up and got what you want. Be encouraged. Your faith has made you well. Jesus didn't say Holy Ghost made you well. He said your faith made you well. I hope not. Has faith been taken off of the earth? Has it? Has faith been removed? Has faith, been, has faith vanished? Has faith no longer a part? In many churches today, there's no faith. In, in denominational churches, there's no faith. There's no faith. There's no faith. But many churches, even in full gospel churches, they're running pretty low on faith. I said, they're running pretty low on faith. Somebody say amen. Even full gospel churches. Has faith been taken off the earth? I hope not because we'd all be going to hell. Because we're saved by grace through faith. Faith is what gives you the, what you need to withstand what's going on out here in the world. Knowing Jesus is coming soon. we got to keep our garments clean. And by faith, knowing that He is going to take us to heaven. Knowing there's going to be a judgment day. When my faith says yes, God will never say no. What about the stories in the Bible? Hannah wanted a son. Did God say tough luck? The widow who was in debt and needed money for her sons. Did Elisha say, tough luck, sister, we're all in a famine. Everybody's got to be out for themselves. Tough it out, get with the rest of us. Stand in line. No. There was a leper who came to Jesus, and when Jesus saw him, did Jesus say, get back, leper, go back to your home, go back to your colony. It's illegal for you to be here with us. No. He touched him, and he spoke to him. He told the blind man, what do you want from me? The blind man said, sir, I just want to believe. That's desperate faith. I just want to believe. Blind man heard Jesus was passing by and he knew this was his one last shot. And he cried out, son of mercy, son of David, have mercy on me. Crown, crowds gathered around and he said, shut up, shut up. And they cried out louder and louder, shut up. He doesn't have time for you. Sometimes I feel like a blind man. Because I scream a lot and I think we get along together real well. He shouted, Son of David, have mercy on me. And when he called the second time, Jesus said, Tell that man to come here. And I told you the story last week, but I want to reemphasize it. Maybe you'll get it this week. The government gave him a begging coat. And they gave the blind a garment from the Roman government to show that he was legitimately blind. He's not like the people that you see at Walmart begging for a sign, begging with a sign saying, help, I'm a retired vet and they're 19 years old. The jacket that the beggar and the blind man wore was proof he was blind. He had been going to the same spot for years and they gave him a coat to prove he was a verified beggar. The Bible said Jesus called the blind man and Jesus took off his coat Jesus tossed it to the side and said, you won't be needing that any longer. <laughs> Amen. That's the kind of God we have. You won't be needing that any longer. You don't need that any longer. You don't need that any longer. You're no longer a beggar. You're no longer sick. You're no longer diseased. You're no longer under government control. The government's not going to step on you any longer. The Bible said when Jesus called the blind man, he took off the coat and said, you won't need it. I'm finished with that. I'm done with that. And Jesus said, what would you like for me to do? What do you believe in God for? Now religion, religious people were screaming, oh, get out of the way. Get out. He don't have time for you. Religion always tries to kill your hope. Amen. So does the news that you watch on TV. Some of you are watching way too much news. Maybe you didn't hear me. Some of you are watching way too much news. Amen. You have no hope. You have no plan. You have no destiny. You have no future. And you're just caught in that trap. 
You watch the news, the economy's getting worse, gas prices are going up. Don't let people dictate your destiny. Your load is getting lighter. I said your load is getting lighter. I said your days are getting brighter. I said you're going from glory to glory, from strength to strength. You're going from victory to victory. I believe God's got great things in for store for you today. You're not going down, you're going up. You're going to see the glory of God. You're going to see the glory of God. I said, you're going to see the glory of God. Somebody ought to shout. Are you ready for the glory of God? I said, are you ready for it? I believe God wants to pour it down on this house. I believe He wants to pour it down on you. And I'm going to ask that every one of you, every one of you, I want every one of you to come stand at the altar with me really quick. Stand here, line the altar real fast. We're going to see the glory of God. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. I said it earlier, I'll say it again. I didn't come here to play pick up sticks and tiddly winks. I come to see the power of God fall. I come to see the power of God. I come to see the power of God. I need you down here. Terry, I need you down here. If you'll just get in that straight line so it'll be real easy for me and step away from the pews, step forward. We'll have two men behind every person. Two men behind every person. Put your hands up. Put your hands up, people. Press in with me. In the name of Jesus, fire fall. In the name of Jesus, fire fall. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, fall. In the name of Jesus, come. Holy Ghost, come! Come with fire! Come with fire! Come with fire! Move, Holy Ghost! Move, Holy Ghost! In Jesus' mighty name, fire fall! In Jesus' mighty name, fire fall! Come, Holy Ghost! Come, Holy Spirit! Move! Move! Move in Jesus' name! Move! Fire fall now! Fire! Fire fall! You're mighty God. You're mighty God. Glorious God. May we never be the same. Fire of God fall. Fire of God fall, my friends. Fire of God fall, my friends. Come now, Holy Ghost. Come now, Holy Ghost. God, I pray for a supernatural anointing. May He never be the same. May He be filled with the fire of God. God, reign me in on my good friend. Bless my sister today in Jesus' name with the fire of God. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, now. Fire, fire in Jesus' name. Fire in Jesus' name. May we never be the same. Never the same in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, receive that fire. In the name of Jesus, receive that fire right now. In Jesus' name, receive that fire. Come on, receive that fire. Take it. Take it. It's yours. Take it. Take it all. Take it all. In Jesus' name. Take it. Take it. In Jesus' name. Take it. Take it, Lord God. Move. 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 Move on your people. Take it now in Jesus' name. Take it now. Take it now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name. May we never be the same. The fire of God fill us. Fill every portion. Every part. Never the same as you say. Fire, fall. Fire, come. Holy Spirit, move. Holy Spirit, move. Do it now. Do it now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Do it now in Jesus' mighty name. Do it now. Do a work that way. Do a work in the heart. When it's all about you. Come on, press in now. Press in with everything you got. 
Press in with everything I'm you got. Sorry, Lord, for Come on, the press in. Lift up your holy hands. Lift up those holy hands. Lift them up to the King you. of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's it's worthy. All you, it's all about Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Oh, oh, I'll bring you more than a song. I'll bring you more than a song. Oh, mighty God. Oh, mighty God. I'll bring you more than a song. I'll bring you more than a song. God, just do a work in my friends. Let the fire of God erupt in Ricky. Let the fire of God come and fall on him. I'll I'll sing you more than a song. Yes. Your looking into my heart. And you're looking into my heart. Yes, I'm listening. Go ahead. I'm coming back to the heart of worship when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it when it's all about you. It's all about you. If you're sick, you got an issue or a problem, you're going through a difficulty or a hurt or a pain that you've got, just slip up your hand. I just, I'll just i come by. Anybody here? Raise up your hand. Anybody here? Lord God, now, Lord God, now, give her a new heart. Give her a new heart right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name, healing, health, wholeness comes to her house. In Jesus' name, let the fire of God heal her. In Jesus' name. Be done. Be done.
How's the heart? The heart is great. How are you feeling here, Marie? How are you feeling, Ruth? Had eight, and the neck ache's gone? Free? Ain't Jesus' name? What you got? Right. Amen. No more, no more water? All right. Amen. You're a healer, God. You're a healer. You're a healer. That knee better? That knee's better? In Jesus' name, that knee's better? Are you better, Pete? Are you better? Somebody ought to shout. Somebody ought to bless God. Somebody ought to be happy here. Somebody ought to be happy in this house. Oh, my. When old Josh and Christine Humphrey come in here the 7th of August, they're going to say something's different in this house. Something's different in these people. God's on fire here in this place. Give the Lord a hand. God bless you.